God's word contains, um, it contains the record of many people's lives. And we go through these lives on a regular basis. We look at them and uh, we investigate what their challenges were. We see their failings uh, and we see their faith. It's important always to recognize scripture for what it is. And the, the, the biblical record we have is not so much an example of good people doing good things. It's people who are overcoming themselves and who are learning to have trust and confidence in God, their father and creator. One that we think of, of course, when we think of the record of people's lives and we think of scripture, Abraham comes to mind, you know, the father of the faithful. Uh, another one would be David, uh, who slew the giant, you know, through faith that he could do this impossible thing. Uh, Daniel, who was deeply loved of God, precious in God's eyes. Now, you could look at these heroes of the faith, if you will, and consider that, oh, well, they're in a special category, you know, and look at them like, um, well, holier than thou, or greater than thou, uh, and come away thinking, well, yeah, you know, I read about these people, but their example doesn't really apply to someone like me. You know, weak um, person like myself. You might assume that people like Abraham or, or David or Daniel were just so spiritually strong that the faith needed to get them through their particular trials came easily. And you could say, well, that was them, that, that'll never be me. All right? So it would be very easy to just look at them like they were these mythical uh, people. But they're not. They're real people. And it would be so easy to say, well, yeah, yeah, but they were, you know, they were special, spiritually strong. I'll, I'll never be like that. That's not me. You know, I might, uh, maybe I can sort of attain a little bit of that. But it'll never be me. Well, what I want to tell you, and I think, well, what God wants to tell you is you can have faith like that. You can. This record is not put out there to make it all just seem so far beyond you that, you know, maybe, never, nah, never. That is not what God's word is about. God wants you to know that you can have faith like that. And hopefully we're going through that and we're looking at it in enough detail to think, well, okay, that's how I would make this work. So we looked at the submission in faith and we've looked at um, kind of the definition of faith. And today we're going to look at the faith of Jesus Christ. All right? And when I say that you can have faith, the reason I'm able to say that with such confidence is that I believe and I, I'll show you that the scriptures tell you you can have the faith of Jesus Christ himself. So I'm not talking about faith in Jesus. I'm talking about something a little different. I'm talking about having the faith that Christ had. And what English Bibles used to call the faith of Christ. If you go back to the old King James or Geneva Bible and that sort of thing, you will see there are certain verses, and we'll go through those, where you read this phrase, the faith of Jesus Christ. We're talking about the faith that got him through his trials and his difficulties and his tests. And yes, Jesus did have trials and troubles. And that's very important for us to remember and not have this, again, idea, oh, well, he just lived this life where he was floating two inches off the ground all the time, just levitating around, and his head was glowing, you know, and it was all very different. And that was him, but, it, you know, I'll never experience anything like that. No, that is not the record. That's not what we actually have in the scriptures and that's not the way we should think about either Jesus or faith. Hebrews chapter 11, of course, is... Yeah, we'll go there, so you may as well go ahead. <laughs> uh, Hebrews chapter 11 is sort of a hall of fame. 
of faith. And we've gone through this many times over the years. It's sort of a hall of fame of faith. Okay? You read it. And we're not going to read the whole chapter. We actually did that as a uh, part of our Bible discussions. We did that last year. Read it and you'll see that right up front, Abraham. Okay, again, I'm getting back to Abraham. Abraham gets all kinds of attention. And, of course, he's spoken of as the father of the faithful. And Paul talks about Abraham quite a lot and uses him as, as an example of faith. The father of the faithful. But who's the greatest example of faith in Scripture? Now, Hebrews chapter 11 ends after 40 verses. Let me get there myself. It ends after 40 verses. If you've got it open there, you'll see, huh, yeah, he's right. (laughs) Well, yeah, I wrote it down. And uh, Hebrews 11 ends after 40 verses. And then chapter 12 starts. Well, that's natural. I don't think I've told you anything that's really that earth-shattering. Chapter 12 starts. The beginning of chapter 12 is really the end of the hall of fame of faith, if you will. We've looked at all these personalities in scripture, and then we hear about who? Jesus Christ. So let's take a look at Hebrews 12. And let's just... Read verses 1 and 2, because I think this is actually, in my, in my eyes, this is the end of that, that Hall of Fame. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, so we've considered all these people that God has worked with over the ages, and here they are, and they're all listed in this chapter, and he says, Since we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of faith or of our faith for the joy set before him he endured the cross scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand throne of God Jesus is described, there's actually quite a bit packed in here. Jesus is described, and we're told that he is the author and perfecter of your faith. Make it personal, your faith, okay? He is the author and perfecter of your faith. Meaning, that means, I would say, he is the one who creates faith in your faith heart and in your mind and in your spirit and whatever you know word you want to use to describe all that is you he is the one who is the author of your faith he's creating that faith in you right and it also says that he's the perfecter of faith which means that not only does he get the ball rolling he keeps it rolling he keeps the plate spinning of your faith <laughs> keeps everything rolling along to the point where you are perfected. You are, and the, the word perfected unfortunately has this, you know, idea of, of everything being um, right and there's no problems, there's no issues. Perfection means, or the word here is teleos, it means that you are complete. You are brought to the point of completion. That fullness of Jesus Christ, that the mind of Christ can be complete in you. And you learn that through all the things that you go through, even the trials that we're talking about in the prayer requests. These are the things that God has to, or Jesus Christ is working in us to bring about faith. He is the author and perfecter of faith. An important consideration and a point. And I, I, I hope that we dwell upon, especially as we move towards Pentecost. He is active, okay? He is an active part of what's going on inside your mind and in your heart and everything else that is you. He's active. He's not off sitting at the right hand of God on the throne with his feet up, you know, drinking a Coke. He's active and involved in your life. And that's something I hope to really bring out today with the scriptures we're going to look at. He's the one who brings you you, me, and all of us to the point 
of fullness and completeness, the perfecter of our faith, and more. But we're going to focus on faith today. And then at the end of that little section there that we read in Hebrews 1 and 2, it, the verse also points out to what was happening in his life and tells you about his greatest trial. He was executed unfairly, right? He didn't deserve it. He'd never done anything wrong. He was executed and killed, and he died to pay the penalty for the things that you've done wrong, to make things all is possible for you and for me. And how did he get through that? Well, we took a look at that in a previous message where we looked at Jesus' prayer before his execution. And let's focus on the faith that he had. He asked the Father, right? He said, do I have to do this? Does it have to go this way? Because I really don't, no one wants to die, right? Even Jesus himself. And at the end, he had to say, your will be done. And that's submission, and we looked at submission previously. But the faith there that I want us to focus on, that's the faith of Jesus Christ. How you, how you and I get through these things in our lives, and how we make them a positive thing. They seem pretty awful, but they are the work of God within you. Everybody has their own cross to bear. We know that because we all lead such different lives. Some people seem to skate through life unscathed. And other people don't. But we all have our cross to bear. God knows and God works with you. And focus on that. So Jesus was willing to die. And that took a lot of faith. He had to believe. Because remember, he was fully human as well. And so he worried about you know, his body and how it hurt. and It took faith. He was filled with faith. That faith of Jesus Christ is what you can have in you. But you should want, and I know you do. So Jesus, through this, was faithful. He was acting in a faithful manner in, in that he did what the Father wanted him to do. And it, we, as we looked at in previous message, faith is not just what's going on up here. It's what it makes us do, how it works out in our lives, that we act and live in faith. So Jesus was faithful in what he did. He was doing what the Father wanted him to do. He gave his life to redeem others. That was the Father's plan, and Jesus went with it. Another one that I'd like to draw your attention to, because it's not all about Jesus' death. It's also about his life. And in his life, what did he say about himself? Well, he said a lot of things, so I'm going to tell you. <laughs> he said, I have kept my Father's commandments. All right? He did a lot. He did more than that. But he did say of himself, I have kept my Father's commandments. I'm going to let you find that scripture. You should know where it is. For you to have the faith that Jesus had, that faith of Christ, means that you live your life like he did. Which is why the, the study of scripture and the study of Jesus' comings and goings and his teachings and his doings are very important for us. And we've gone through that again as a congregation. And that's why we do things like that. We walk through that because this is your, the pattern. This is what you look to as your pattern. Not only that, but we present ourselves, you and I, we present ourselves to God as living sacrifices. And so in that way, we're also doing the other part of what Jesus did. We are sacrificing ourselves, our lives. Not that we are put to death, but as Romans 12 talks about, we are living sacrifices, that we live holy and blameless, a life of righteousness, which is a huge topic. And we practice judgment. And mercy. And we keep his commands. And we let them be written on our heart. And on our mind. And in our inward parts. And we have greater depth and greater understanding. Again, because of the teachings that we have from Jesus Christ himself. And this is what scripture means when it's talking about righteousness that comes through faith 
That's what scripture is really getting at when it says there is a righteousness that comes through faith. That's what we're talking about, friends. Turn to Philippians 3, verse 9. These are scriptures that are badly messed up, and they mess people up. So we're going to go through them, and I, I hope that I don't, I hope I do a good job of it. It takes a little thought. You have to think about what's going on here, friends. So Philippians 3, verse 9, says, Paul's talking about himself, and he says, I have lost all things, but I consider them as nothing that I may gain Christ. Verse 9, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Okay, there's that scripture. I put it on the table there. Now this is an example of um, what English Bibles used to call or used to translate the faith of the Jesus Christ. So you could read that and you could say um, there is a righteousness that, uh, not a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is the faith of Jesus Christ. And if you have an old King James, I think that's what it says. And if you look at the underlying language, you'll see, yeah, that's, that's what it says. All right? So we're talking about the faith of Jesus Christ. A modern translation, the New King James Version included, if you have a New King James, I think a lot of people here do, uh, you'll see that it's translated faith in Christ. A tiny little word, but it really changes the way you look at that scripture. So most translations nowadays say faith in Christ. And they've got all these grammatical reasons why they think that's so. The problem is, and I believe this is a translation that's sort of led by people's assumption, well, this is what it's supposed to mean. It's not quite what it says, but this is what it really means. So we're going to translate it in a way that will help you understand it better according to the way it should be understood. The implication that's left behind by changing it from the faith of Christ to the faith in Christ is that people are led to believe that, well, simple belief in, in Jesus I mean, by that I mean sort of like the intellectual grasping that, okay, he was who he said he was, and he did what he said he would do. He did sacrifice himself as payment for sins. People have this idea that, okay, that counts as righteousness. That belief, that sort of intellectual acceptance of these realities, well, that's my righteousness. Am I wrong? I mean, that's, that's kind of where people take it. But that's not what the faith of Jesus Christ is. The faith of Jesus Christ is how he lived his life, how he thought about his life in relationship to God and trials and tests and troubles. So what we're really talking about is a faith-filled life like Jesus Christ. Okay, Head knowledge and emotions are not the criteria for your final assessment before God. You will not stand before God and him say, so did you accept these intellectual realities? Okay, that's your righteousness. Do you really think that's what's going to happen when you stand before God? No, it isn't. Actually, that's a problem they had all through scripture. It's called Gnosticism, in my opinion. That's my opinion. The idea that secret knowledge gains you access to the eternal is not true. It's how you live, what you do with that knowledge that gains you all the good things that God has out there for you and for me. Don't worry, I'm not going to go into a historical <laughs> diatribe on Gnosticism. <laughs> Much as I like doing stuff like that, I won't. Turn to Galatians 2, verse 16. Galatians 2, verse 16. <clears throat> Here's another one of those scriptures. Galatians 2, verse 16 a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Jesus Christ, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. So this is, this is another one of those ones. The verse, actually, when you look at it, it uses both ways of describing faith. 
and you look at the underlying language, that's the way it works. Both wordings are used here. All right? First, it mentions the faith of Christ. Okay? Then it says, and I think it says, uh, the NIV says, so we too. Uh, I think in the King James it says, even. Uh, you could put in the word furthermore, or plus, or and, or whatever. All right? So then it says, we also have faith in Christ. All right? And the second use of it there uses a different grammatical structure. And I'm not going to go into all that because it would bog down in that. But look at it if you wish. Look at it if you wish, and you'll see that there are two different grammatical constructions that are side by side. What the scripture is saying is we need the faith of Christ to be justified. And then it says, furthermore, we need faith in Christ. So we need both. We do need to accept that Jesus was who he was, that he did what he said, but we also need the faith of Christ. So they're both there. They're both there. Okay? And that's, that's how it really does work, right? You have to accept the truth, and then you have to live the truth. We know that. We talk about it all the time. You need the head knowledge, that belief in Christ. And you need the living, active faith, which is the belief of Christ. We need both in order to be justified, which is a biblical, well, King Jamesy kind of way of saying, to be declared righteous in God's eyes. Paul is making a parallel, if you will, between the two in this, in this sentence, if you will. But modern translators have made it so that both phrases, uh, both phrases are rendered the same way. All right? And it kind of turns the sentence into kind of repetitive nonsense, if you will. We need the faith, in, we need the faith, we need faith in Jesus Christ. Therefore, we need faith in Jesus Christ. Or, or also we need faith in Jesus Christ. It just says the same thing over. But when you really look at what it's supposed to be saying, it says we need the faith of Christ and we need faith in Christ. Saying both. So that's, that's how you need to look at that verse, friends. Because that's, that's what Paul's doing. He's making this parallel between the two. But modern translators have made them both the same. All right? The phrase faith of Christ, which is the old traditional way of, of translating it, the, the phrase faith of Christ in verses like this, another one is Romans 3, verse 21, is telling you that you can be declared righteous or made righteous in the eyes of God through Christ's own faith being implanted in you. Christ's own faith being implanted in you through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's a big deal. That is a big deal. The power of God in you, uh, the power of Christ in you, or Christ living in you, these are all different ways of saying the same thing. Scripture does that a lot. God's word takes the same truth and approaches it from a variety of different angles so that you get it. And you don't get lost in the words and the grammar because it's being attacked from a variety of different angles. We're in Galatians. Drop down to verse 20. Let's see what Paul's making. A, he's making a larger argument. You know, he's, The message Paul had in this is not meant to be from a single sentence. You go down to verse 20. He talks a little bit more about the whole process. And then in verse 20 he says, I, speaking of his life, he says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's another place where the translation really should be the faith of. Right? I live by the faith of the Son of God. It makes more sense also when you look at the context. Because what is he saying here? What is he talking about? He's saying, I have been crucified with Christ, but Christ lives in me. He's talking about 
something that has been planted in him. And it's planted in you as well. So the context, if you think about it, makes a whole lot more sense if it were translated as it probably as it should be, I live by the faith of the Son of God, implanted and living and growing within you. Paul's talking about Christ living in him. The active living faith that Jesus himself had, which we understand better by understanding his life better. Knowing it, reading about it, meditating on it. The active living faith that Jesus had, active and living in Paul, active and living in you. The faith of Christ. The faith of Christ. Jesus lived his flesh and blood life filled with faith. That's how he could be described. Filled with faith. He had a lot of good things, but we're focusing on faith today. He lived his flesh and blood life filled with faith and perfect obedience to his Father's will. And his father's commands. And now, we're talking today, right here in this very room. Now, through the power of the Holy Spirit, he will, and for many, perhaps most in this room, has planted that within you. Think of it like a seed, okay? And this is an analogy with great pedigree because Jesus used this often a seed all right a seed so that it, that it will grow and become strong and become powerful in you like the mustard seed that's the example i have in my mind he used the uh, analogy of a of mustard seed to talk about the kingdom of god is like a mustard seed really teeny weeny and small but grows into a mighty tree with you know branches for birds and stuff like that so think of this faith that's put in you through the power of the Spirit, the presence of Jesus Christ in you, as a seed. And a seed that grows. A seed that grows. Hopefully into a mighty bush. With that said, there are two wrong conclusions that I want to address right now, or, or potential wrong conclusions. All right? People can get the wrong idea based on what we're talking about here. The first potential dead end is to believe that, for, that Jesus put his own faith in you in place of, or instead of, or as a replacement for your own inadequate, weak faith. If he kind of takes it out and puts a new one in, you know, like a put a new heart in someone or something like that, you know, just like a transplant. And this can lead to the belief, very common, that, there, that, well, because of that, there's nothing more that I need to do. There's no exercise of will on my part that's required because Jesus just put his own faith in me and whatever happens, happens. And it all makes sense because it's the faith of Jesus, right? It can lead us to the belief that there is nothing more that we need to do. Like those songs you hear, if you ever listen to Christian radio, that say, Christ has done it all for you. Eh, not so much. Okay. There's another, a second, equally wrong idea, which is that Christ is working in you, and the work that he does is to strengthen your inadequate faith. Like to take the faith that you have and build it up and make it stronger and stronger and stronger until it reaches his own level, the faith of, of Christ, you know? And, or maybe just the level that is adequate for God's purposes, okay? <laughs> Let's say that. It sounds better, but it still misses the mark because we're missing something very important. And that is that you actually receive a measure of Christ's own faith as a gift. You get that put in you. And it's something separate. 
and unique. You get the, a measure of Christ's own faith as a gift from God through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is, the, this is what I will call a measure of the actual living faith of Jesus Christ that's working in you. And this is what the scriptures mean when they say Jesus is living in you. He's not taking over like you're some kind of robot and he's taken over and he's got the steering wheel in his hands and he's moving you around and controlling you. That's not what it's talking about at all. Actually, it's talking about, uh, if you will, a dialogue, a teaching experience. Um, you can refer back to some previous messages that uh, we've, we've had here, um, thinking of the one that I did on the spirit in man. And again, this is something we mention often. I think all the people who speak here mention this from time to time, that you are created in the likeness of God, right? Do we, we talk about that all the time. You have been created in the likeness of God. You have a spiritual component that has been put in you. Okay, We're not talking about the Holy Spirit here. We're talking about the spirit in man, the spirit in humans. This was something that was given to the first humans, Adam, Eve. God breathed the spirit into them. And you have a spirit in you. That's another message for another day to go through all the scriptures on that. But turn to Romans 8 and verse 16, if you would. Romans 8, verse 16. Even that little baby has the spirit. God has something very special in mind for that little baby. Just like he does for each and every one of us in this room. You get it when you're... That's what makes you human. Makes you a creation in the image of God. In Romans 8 verse 16. Where am I? The spirit, and that's referring to the Holy Spirit from God testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Great scripture to you know, talk about this subject. We're not going to go into the spirit in man in entirety, but it's saying what it says. The spirit, God's spirit. Something outside of you, this Holy Spirit, is working with something that is part of you. The spirit that is within you. The spirit testifies with our spirit, that we are God's children. And this word testifies, if you look up meanings of words, and I know some of you have tablets, you can click on the word and you can see what they mean. Testify means to dialogue with. It means to talk to, to uh, go through things together. And this is what's happening. God's spirit is at work in you. That seed, something that wasn't you, has been put in you. And it's working with you to achieve something truly wonderful, truly special, and spiritual. Again, it's a bigger subject. But God's spirit works with your spirit throughout the course of your life to bring about something totally new. A new creation, uh, a new person, born again, however you like to say it. And... Uh, the analogy I like is uh, considering it like two, the, the two parents bringing their own chromosomes together, and then there's you. And nobody else in the world has a set of chromosomes exactly like yours, right? And you're you now, but you came about from this combination. And it's an analogy. Don't take it too far. But the idea is that something new and unique is created by this kind of process comes together and informs you. Faith is a product of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's called in Scripture the fruit or a fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is just a, a kind of, I guess, an older way of saying the product of, you know, what it produces. The Holy Spirit produces things and one of the things that the Holy Spirit produces is faith, right? 
And as part of that spirit working within your spirit, Jesus' own faith works together with your faith. And consider that, that Jesus' own faith is within you, as we read there in Romans 8, 16, testifying, talking with you. Um, His faith is not a substitute for your faith. He's not going to just move in and take over and do it all for you. That's not what's going on. Nor is it just that your faith is being grown up big and strong. It's something new and something different. It's a new creation. Turn to John 14, verse 23. John 14, verse 23. This is the section of scripture that we uh, went through during the spring holy days. Uh, go through it we go back to it all the time though it's teaching that's in season always and when Jesus is talking to the disciples he's telling them about the Holy Spirit and in verse 23 he says anyone who loves me will obey my teaching and my father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them so something is happening inside you. Turn to 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. Writing to his congregation in Corinth, Paul tells them, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst, among you? So not only is he talking about God's spirit being in the individual, but among the body of Christ, all the people gathered together. But here it's rendered as God's spirit dwelling in you and among you. So we see the two things sort of parallel there. The presence of God, the presence of the spirit. They're just, in some ways, different ways to say the same thing. The presence of God in you, the presence of Christ in you is through the power of the Holy Spirit in you, which is his spirit. 1 John 3, verse 24. And this one will tie us back to earlier parts of this message. Verse 24 says, The one who keeps God's commands lives in him. So that person is in God. And he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. So here we have this connection there. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him, lives in God, and God in them. So this quid pro quo, this dialogue, is happening, but there's a criteria added to it, which is those commands. Living faithfully means you got to do what God tells you to do. you got to live the way he wants you to live. All right? Now, look, anybody, anybody, and plenty of people do, anybody can say, the Spirit of God is in me. Anybody can say that. They're just words that come out of your mouth. The Spirit of God is in me. How would you or I know if that's true? Let's say someone burst through the door and said, the Spirit of God is in me. Listen to me. I've got a message for you. How would you know if that's true or not? Well, one of my favorite verses in Isaiah. Isaiah says, and I'll let you find this verse. It says, to the law and the testimony. Charge up the hill to the law and the testimony. That's where the answer is, friends. The way you know is ask, is that life, that person who ran in the door and said, the Spirit of God is on me, is that life in conformity to the boundaries provided by God's commandments. Is that, what's, is that what we're seeing? Because if it's all in your head, you know, is it all a dream? Is it all just thoughts? Is it all subjective? If it's all in your head or his head or her head or my head, then we're all lost. But it's not. The answer to that question 
is given through scripture. And I mean the fact that we have it. We have been given a written code. And one of the ways we use this written code, and it could be written on papyrus or written on paper, or it could be carved in stone. We use this. It's provided to us by God for use. With it, with the word of God, we can check and we can verify what's going on within us. You know, we talk about all these spiritual things, you know, how the spirit of God is working in us and this is happening and so forth. Well, how do you know? How do you know you're not just thinking wishful thoughts? Compare it to the written code. And that's why we talk about the authority of scripture. We talk about archaeology. We might talk about various things like that. So that we have confidence in the written code. We are able to verify what we experience and what's going on within us against something that is concrete and exists outside our own thoughts. I didn't write the Bible. You didn't write it either. You didn't even translate it. But you've got it. And that's what you can use it for. Is what I'm experiencing in life real? Yeah, it is. It's real. Compare it to something concrete that exists outside your own thoughts or your emotions or your subjective experiences. Because that's what, that's what people are trying to tell you, that it's all a dream. It's all in your head. If you're in, still in John, we read verse 24. And again, you know, sometimes the chapter breaks are so unfortunate. But read the next verse. Okay, so it says, The one who keeps God command, God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So I put it to you, you know, when we talk about all these very spiritual things, you use the touchstone with reality that God has given you. It's been in place for thousands of years. And it's been good and useful and helpful for people throughout the ages at all times. Paul also writes in Thessalonians, and I'll let you look this one up. I like to give these little <laughs> teasers out there. Paul writes in Thessalonians, do not quench the spirit. Don't let the power of the Holy Spirit and its fire go out in you. And then he says, and don't despise and consider the written teachings of no value. Don't despise the prophecies. And then he says, test and prove everything. Hold on to what is good. So we have this spiritual experience going on in our lives, and I hope it's powerful and real in you. But we also have his word. And we need to go back to this and verify and test the spirit. What's happening? Because anyone can say, the Spirit of God told me X, Y, and Z. But how do you know? How do I know? How do they know? Jesus Christ actually lives in you. Okay? And it's a spiritual thing. I don't know if they did some, you know, one of those things where they can trace your brain waves and that they might see some unique activity but they'd explain it away you know using electricity and molecules and chemical reactions and stuff like that but it doesn't really matter what matters is you know it the holy spirit is in you jesus is living in you the presence of god these are all you know as i mentioned earlier these are just different ways of saying the same thing his thoughts and his actions, or sorry, yeah, no, his thoughts and his actions impact and influence and direct your thoughts and actions. That's the spirit testifying with your spirit. His thoughts and actions are going to influence and make a difference in your thoughts and your actions as much as you will let him. You can resist the spirit. And, you know, God's word says don't resist the spirit. But then you also have to be careful that you don't just think, well, the Spirit's telling me to do what I want to do. Because, <laughs> you know, we all, we all have to battle that. We know that through Scripture. And so in this way, you can live 
like Jesus did, okay? Exhibiting his character and following his pattern of faith, and he will actively intervene, empower, and assist you as needed for the perfection of your faith. Galatians 5, verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, and faith. Faith is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in you is going to produce faith. The work of God in the presence of Jesus Christ in you is going to produce faith. Of course, there are others that God wants us to build up as well. Romans 12. For by the grace given me, that's Paul speaking, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Or in the King James, I think it says the measure, the measure of faith that God has given you. We receive faith, right? Now it's, not as, it's not an all or nothing brain dump you know, that takes over all your thoughts. You are given a measure, as it says there, a measure of faith. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 9. This is the section of Scripture that talks about spiritual gifts. And there's a long list of all these spiritual gifts. And he's saying, you know, some people have this and some people have that. Look at verse 9. He says, um, actually, let's back up to verse 8. To one there is given the, through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that same Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy, etc., etc. Point is... Uh, the amount of faith given to you is unique and individual. We're not all given the same dose, if you will. <laughs> Some people are really blessed with a blessing of faith. That's cool. I'd like to be among those. <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes I wonder. It's not one size fits all. Uh, everybody has their own walk. All right, 1 John 5, verse 4. 1 John 5, verse 4. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. They achieve something. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Success that we have, our success in growing into the fullness of Christ is accomplished through faith. Living that faith, building that faith, Having that faith. There's all these different angles and ways to look at it. So it's accomplished through faith, but it also is the substance of our faith, right? Don't want to get too metaphysical on you there. So I have a takeaway. Oh, I think uh, it's a good thing to have a takeaway. We've talked about all these things, and you know, you don't want to leave thinking, oh, well, you know, that's interesting, and now I understand things better than I did before. I have an assignment, if you will, all right? A good one. I think it's pretty easy. Ask God to increase your faith. Ask God to increase your faith. Easy assignment, I hope. Ask, because as we've seen here, it is a gift. God wants to give it to us. But we know, we know, just like as a parent, sometimes you say, yeah, I know what you need, but I'd, I'd like you to ask. Ask God for faith. Ask him for faith. I've, you know, various times and, you know, over the years, I've asked God for certain things in my prayers. And, um, you know, I think sometimes we can get kind of very focused on this or that. And we can think about our physical needs and help me with my job or um, help me with my kids or help so-and-so in the congregation and so forth. I might even, I, I know I've asked, God, can you help me have joy? As I was kind of down in the dumps. What I really, it's funny because I kind of got, uh, the answer was I got faith instead. <laughs> So ask God for faith. 
this is a good thing. It's a good thing to have. And he's got it there to give it to you, and you actually need it from God. So that's my takeaway and a call to action. Ask God to increase your faith. And I'm going to assume that you've got the spirit in you. and Some don't, but you also can have God's spirit working with you. And that's a different subject. So I want everyone to think soberly about this. Ask God to increase that faith that he's already put in you. Let's just take a look at a couple of scriptures on the way out here. Uh, Mark 9. Verse 24, things to think about in light of this assignment. Mark 9, verse 24, this is a a healing Jesus is involved in. Our demons cast out of this little boy, and there's a little, I guess they're talking about, well, can he really do this? Can this really happen? And um, Jesus says, "Uh, everything is possible for the one who believes and then in verse 24, the guy comes back and he, he says, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. So you can have faith and doubt at the same time. And what, the, what he's, you know, I think this is something that we should dwell on. Um, I believe, I have faith. Help me in my faith. Because I need more. Cry out, I have faith. Please grow and build the faith of Christ in me. Let's take a look at Luke 17. This will be our last scripture. Luke 17, verse 5. I mentioned the seed analogy earlier. And in verse 5, the apostles, all these people who are following around with Jesus and learning from him, They said, increase our faith. Faith is not a one-time deal. It's not something that descends upon you and just, it's all done in a moment, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. No, faith is something that grows and builds over time. And as the disciples, or the apostles here, said to the Lord, increase our faith. And then he talks about the mustard seed. Oh, if you had faith as small as a mustard seed. And it goes on. So that's my, where I got the analogy of the seed from. But I say, you know, let's ask that God increase our faith. Thank you. Thank you, Father. And thank you, Jesus Christ, for that small seed of faith that you've given. Help it to grow in me to be as strong and mighty tree, if you will. So ask God to increase in you the faith of Jesus Christ.